Chapter 1. The Boy from Virginia Thomas Jefferson was born on a cold spring day in 1743, in a small town called Shadwell, Virginia. The world was very different back then, a time of horse-drawn carriages, flickering candlelight, and wooden houses. But even in this quiet, simple world, something extraordinary was about to happen. Thomas was the third of ten children in his family. His father, Peter Jefferson, was a strong and hard-working man. He was a surveyor, someone who measured land, and he owned a large farm. Peter taught young Thomas the value of hard work and the importance of being honest. His mother, Jane Randolph Jefferson, came from a well-known family, and she made sure Thomas learned how to read and write at an early age. From the moment he could hold a book, Thomas was fascinated by the world of words. He would spend hours sitting by the fire, reading stories of ancient heroes, distant lands, and great adventures. Books were his window to the world, a world much bigger than Shadwell. But Thomas wasn't just a bookworm. He loved nature, too. He would often wander through the forests and fields near his home, exploring the plants, animals, and rivers. The beauty of the natural world filled him with wonder and a deep love for the land that would stay with him all his life. When Thomas was nine years old, his father decided it was time for him to get a formal education. This was no small thing. Many children at that time didn't have the chance to go to school. But Peter Jefferson believed in the power of knowledge. So, Thomas was sent to a small school where he learned the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. But soon, Thomas wanted more. He wanted to learn about the world beyond Shadwell. His father noticed this and decided to send him to a more advanced school. Here, Thomas began to learn Latin, Greek, and French, languages that opened up even more books and more ideas. He studied history, science, and literature, soaking up knowledge like a sponge. Tragedy struck when Thomas was just 14 years old. His father passed away. It was a heavy blow for the young boy. But instead of giving up, Thomas decided to honor his father's memory by working even harder. He took his studies seriously, determined to make something of himself. When he turned 16, Thomas left home to attend the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. This was a big step, a new chapter in his life. The college was far from home, and it was filled with new people, new ideas, and new challenges. But Thomas was ready. At college, Thomas studied under some of the best teachers in Virginia. He learned about mathematics, science, law, and philosophy. He read the works of great thinkers like John Locke, who wrote about the rights of individuals and the importance of government by the people. These ideas fascinated Thomas. They were the seeds of the great thoughts that would one day change a nation. But college wasn't all about books and studying. Thomas also learned to play the violin, a skill that would bring him joy throughout his life. He practiced for hours, becoming quite skilled. Music was a way for him to relax, to express the emotions that words sometimes couldn't capture. Thomas also met people who would become lifelong friends, friends who shared his love of learning and his passion for new ideas. Together, they would spend hours debating, discussing, and dreaming about the future. They talked about freedom, about the rights of people, and about the possibility of a better world. But Thomas wasn't just a dreamer. He was also a doer. After graduating from college, he decided to study law. He knew that the law was the key to justice, and he wanted to use it to help people. He became a lawyer and soon he was traveling around Virginia, helping people with their legal problems. He listened to their stories, their hopes, and their fears. And he began to think, how could the laws be better? How could they protect the rights of everyone? These were big questions. Questions that would eventually lead Thomas Jefferson to write some of the most important words in American history. But for now, he was still a young man full of energy and ideas, ready to take on the world. In the years that followed, 
Thomas continued to grow as a thinker and a leader. He became involved in politics, where he began to make a name for himself as a man of principle and vision. But deep down, he never forgot his roots. The lessons he learned as a boy in Shadwell, the love of books, the beauty of nature, and the belief in hard work and honesty. These were the things that shaped him, the things that made him who he was. And as he stood on the threshold of history, ready to play his part in the founding of a new nation, Thomas Jefferson was driven by one simple truth, the belief that all people deserve the chance to be free. Chapter 2 A Young Lawyer with Big Ideas Thomas Jefferson had finished his studies, but his journey was just beginning. After years of learning and exploring ideas, he was ready to take on the world. With a heart full of dreams and a mind buzzing with ideas, he stepped into the world as a young lawyer. But Thomas wasn't just any lawyer. He was a lawyer with a mission. Jefferson began his legal career in Virginia, a place where people needed help navigating the complex world of laws and courts. The legal system could be confusing even scary, for the ordinary person. But Thomas had a way of making things clear. He listened carefully to the people who came to him, understanding their problems and worries. He wasn't just there to win cases. He was there to help. As he traveled through the towns and countryside of Virginia, Thomas saw the challenges people faced. He saw how the laws often favored the rich and powerful leaving the poor and ordinary people with little protection. This didn't sit well with Jefferson. He believed that laws should be fair, that they should protect everyone, not just the few. These thoughts grew inside him, pushing him to think about how things could be better, how the laws could be changed to bring more justice to the world. One day, as he rode his horse through the rolling hills of Virginia, Jefferson had a realization. The law wasn't just about rules. It was about rights. The rights of the people. The right to live freely, to speak openly, to work and own property without fear. These rights were not just given by kings or governments. They were natural rights, belonging to everyone simply because they were human. This was a powerful idea, and it would shape everything Jefferson would do in the years to come. But how could these big ideas be put into practice? How could the law be changed to protect these rights? Jefferson began to write down his thoughts, filling page after page with his bold ideas. He thought about how laws could be written to ensure fairness, how the government could be structured to serve the people, not control them. These were not easy questions, but Jefferson was determined to find answers. One of the cases that deeply affected Jefferson was that of a local farmer who was being unfairly taxed. The man had worked hard all his life, but the taxes demanded by the British government were too high, threatening to take away his farm. Jefferson took on the case, arguing passionately that the taxes were unjust. He lost the case, but the fight stayed with him. It was one more example of how the powerful used the law to oppress the weak and it fueled his desire for change. Jefferson's reputation as a lawyer grew. People began to see him not just as someone who understood the law, but as someone who wanted to use it to make the world a better place. He was known for his integrity, for his deep commitment to justice. But while many lawyers were content with the way things were, Jefferson was not. He wanted more than just to practice law. He wanted to reform it. As time went on, Jefferson started to get involved in local politics. He believed that the best way to change the laws was to become part of the system that created them. He was elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses, the colonial government's assembly, where he would have a voice in shaping the laws of the land. This was a big step, and it was here that Jefferson's ideas would start to take root. In the House of Burgesses, Jefferson quickly made his mark. He spoke out against British rule, arguing that the American colonies should have the right to govern themselves. He believed that the people who lived in America knew what was best for them, 
not some king thousands of miles away. His speeches were filled with passion and conviction, and they began to inspire others. People started to see Jefferson as a leader, someone who could help guide them to a better future. But Jefferson didn't just talk about change, he worked hard to make it happen. He began drafting new laws, laws that reflected his belief in the rights of the people. One of his first major efforts was a bill to allow people the freedom to worship as they chose. At that time, everyone was expected to follow the same religion, but Jefferson believed that faith was a personal matter. His bill wasn't passed right away, but it was the beginning of a fight for religious freedom that would eventually become a cornerstone of American law. Another idea that Jefferson championed was the need for education. He believed that for people to be truly free, they needed to be educated, to understand their rights and how to protect them. He dreamed of a system of public education that would be available to everyone, rich or poor. This was a radical idea at the time, but Jefferson was convinced that it was essential for a free society. As Jefferson's ideas grew, so did the tensions between the American colonies and Britain. The British government was imposing more and more taxes and laws that the colonists found unfair. The people were getting angry, and the idea of independence began to spread like wildfire. Jefferson was at the heart of this growing movement. He believed that it was time for the colonies to break free, to create a new nation where the rights of the people would be protected. By the time the 1770s arrived, Jefferson's ideas had become more than just thoughts on paper. They had become a powerful force that was beginning to shape the future. He was no longer just a young lawyer with big ideas. He was becoming a leader of a revolution. But Jefferson knew that the road ahead would not be easy. The fight for freedom would require courage, sacrifice, and unwavering belief in the cause. And as he stood on the brink of this great struggle, he knew that his ideas, his belief in justice, in the rights of the people, would guide him through the challenges to come. The journey that had begun in the quiet hills of Virginia, the journey of a young lawyer with big ideas, was about to take him and a whole nation into a battle for independence. The world was about to change forever and Thomas Jefferson was ready to play his part. Chapter 3 The Call to Revolution The year was 1775, a time of great tension and uncertainty. The thirteen American colonies were buzzing with talk of freedom, talk of rebellion. The British government had pushed the people too far with heavy taxes and unfair laws, Anger was growing, and the whispers of revolution were turning into shouts. In Virginia, Thomas Jefferson was no longer just a young lawyer with big ideas. He was now a respected leader. His words carried weight, and his ideas were beginning to shape the future. People looked to him for guidance, for courage, and for a vision of what could be. Then the call came. Jefferson was asked to join the Continental Congress, a gathering of the most important leaders from all the colonies. This was not just any meeting. It was a gathering that would decide the fate of the nation. The colonies were ready to stand up to Britain, but they needed a plan. They needed someone who could put their thoughts and dreams into words that would inspire the world. Jefferson accepted the call. He traveled to Philadelphia, the city where the Continental Congress was meeting. The journey was long and difficult, but Jefferson knew it was important. As he rode through the towns and villages, he saw the determination in the faces of the people, the determination to be free. This filled him with a sense of purpose. He knew that something great was about to happen. When Jefferson arrived in Philadelphia, he found himself among some of the most brilliant minds in America. There was John Adams, the fiery lawyer from Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin, the wise and witty inventor, and George Washington, the brave leader who would soon command the Continental Army. These men, along with many others, 
were ready to challenge the most powerful empire in the world. The debates in the Congress were long and heated. Some leaders wanted to try one last time to make peace with Britain, while others believed that the only way forward was independence. Jefferson listened carefully. He weighed the arguments. But deep down, he knew what he believed. The time for talk was over. The time for action had come. As the days passed, the idea of declaring independence became stronger and stronger. But how could they do it? How could they tell the world that they were breaking away from Britain? They needed a document, a statement that would explain their reasons, that would declare their right to be free. The task was enormous, but Jefferson was ready. On June 11, 1776, the Congress appointed a committee to draft this declaration. There were five men on the committee, including John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. But when it came time to write, all eyes turned to Jefferson. He was known for his way with words, his ability to capture big ideas in clear, powerful language. The responsibility was heavy, but Jefferson took it on without hesitation. For days, Jefferson worked tirelessly. He shut himself away in a small room with only a quill, ink, and a stack of parchment. The room was quiet. The only sound was the scratch of the quill as he wrote. Jefferson's mind was racing. How could he express the hopes, dreams, and demands of an entire nation? How could he create something that would inspire people to fight for their freedom? He began with a bold statement a statement that would echo through history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. These words were more than just an introduction. They were a declaration of the very principles that the new nation would stand for. Jefferson wrote about the rights that every person should have, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These were not just words on a page. They were the foundation of a new kind of government, a government that would serve the people, not rule over them. Jefferson also made sure to list the many ways in which the British king had wronged the colonies. He wrote about the unfair taxes, the cruel laws, and the king's refusal to listen to the people. This wasn't just a document. It was a call to action. It was a message to the world that America would no longer be a colony. It would be a free and independent nation. When Jefferson finished his draft, he shared it with the committee. They made a few changes, but the heart of the document, the powerful words that Jefferson had crafted, remained the same. The committee presented the draft to the Congress, and on July 2, 1776, they voted in favor of independence. But the work wasn't done yet. The Congress spent two more days debating the Declaration, making small changes, and refining the language. Jefferson watched as his words were discussed and dissected, but he knew that what mattered most was the message, the message that freedom was worth fighting for. Finally, on July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. The room was filled with a sense of history, a sense that, Something incredible had just happened. The Declaration was signed by the leaders of the colonies, and it was sent out to be read aloud in towns and cities across America. When the people heard the words, they were filled with hope and determination. The Declaration of Independence wasn't just a piece of paper. It was a promise. A promise that they would fight for their freedom, no matter the cost. Jefferson's words became the rallying cry of a nation, and they inspired people to join the fight for independence. But the road ahead would not be easy. The war for independence would be long and brutal. Many would sacrifice their lives for the cause. But Jefferson's declaration had given them something to believe in, something worth fighting for. As the cannons roared and the battles raged, the words of the Declaration echoed in the hearts of the soldiers and in the hearts of people around the world. The fight for freedom had begun, and there was no turning back.
Thomas Jefferson, the man who had once been a young lawyer with big ideas, had now become the voice of a revolution. And as the sun set on that historic day in July, the world knew that something extraordinary had happened. A new nation was born. Chapter 4. Writing the Declaration of Independence The room was quiet, the air thick with anticipation. Outside, the city of Philadelphia was bustling with activity, but inside, Thomas Jefferson was alone with his thoughts. The dim light of a candle flickered on the walls, casting shadows that danced as if they too felt the importance of the moment. Jefferson sat at a simple wooden desk, a blank piece of parchment before him, and in his hand, a quill dipped in ink, ready to shape the future of a nation. Jefferson took a deep breath. He knew the weight of the task that lay before him. The colonies had made their decision. They would break away from Britain. But how could they explain this bold move to the world? How could they justify their rebellion against the most powerful empire on earth? The answer would have to be powerful, clear, and inspiring. And it was up to Jefferson to find the right words. He began to write, when, in the course of human events, his quill moved steadily, forming the first lines of what would become one of the most famous documents in history. These words were more than just an introduction. They were a statement of intent, a signal that something extraordinary was about to happen. Jefferson's mind was filled with ideas, ideas that had been brewing for years. He thought about the principles he believed in, the rights that every person should have simply by being human. These rights were not granted by kings or governments. They were self-evident, meaning they were obvious to anyone who looked. And so he wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The words flowed from his quill like a river, strong and unstoppable. Jefferson wrote about the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These were not just abstract ideas, they were the core of what it meant to be free. To live without fear, to make one's own choices, to seek joy and fulfillment. These were the things worth fighting for. But Jefferson didn't stop there. He knew that the world would want to know why the colonies were breaking away from Britain. So he listed the many wrongs that the British king had committed against the American people. He wrote about the unfair taxes, the harsh laws, and the way the king had ignored the pleas of the colonists. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good, Jefferson wrote, each word dripping with the frustration and anger of a people pushed too far. As he wrote, Jefferson's mind flashed back to the cases he had fought as a young lawyer. The farmer who had been crushed by unfair taxes, the families who had suffered under British rule. These memories fueled his passion. He wasn't just writing a document. He was giving voice to the hopes and dreams of an entire nation. Hours passed as Jefferson worked, the candle burning low. The room was silent, except for the soft scratch of the quill on parchment. Outside, the city slept, unaware that within those four walls, History was being made. Jefferson's hand grew tired, but he pushed on, determined to finish what he had started. Finally, as the first light of dawn crept through the window, Jefferson put down his quill. The Declaration of Independence was complete. He read over his work, his heart pounding with a mixture of exhaustion and excitement. He knew that these words, these simple yet powerful words, would change everything. But Jefferson also knew that his work was not yet done. The draft would have to be reviewed by the Continental Congress, where it would be debated and possibly revised. He was prepared for this, but he also hoped that the essence of what he had written would remain. The ideas of freedom, equality, and the rights of all people were too important to lose. A few days later, Jefferson presented his draft to the committee. John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, both members of the committee, read through the document carefully. 
They made a few changes, tweaking the language here and there, but the heart of the Declaration, the bold and revolutionary ideas, remained intact. The committee then presented the draft to the full Congress. The debates were intense. Some members wanted to tone down the language. Others wanted to add more grievances against the king. But as the discussions continued, it became clear that Jefferson's words had struck a chord. The delegates knew that this document was more than just a statement of independence. It was a declaration of the values that would define the new nation. Finally, on July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. The room was filled with a sense of triumph and relief. The delegates knew that by signing this document, they were committing to a dangerous course. But they also knew that it was the right course. They were declaring to the world that they were free, that they would no longer be ruled by a distant king. The Declaration was sent out to be read in public squares, in churches, and in town halls across the thirteen colonies. When the people heard the words, they cheered. They wept. They knew that something extraordinary had happened. Jefferson's words had given them the courage to fight, and the belief that they could win. For Thomas Jefferson, the moment was bittersweet. He was proud of what he had written, proud to have played a part in the birth of a new nation. But he also knew that the road ahead would be difficult. The war for independence was far from over, and the future of America was uncertain. But one thing was clear. The Declaration of Independence was more than just a document. It was a beacon of hope, a symbol of freedom that would inspire not only the people of America, but people all over the world. Jefferson had poured his soul into those words, and they had become the foundation of a new nation. A nation built on the principles of equality, justice, and liberty for all. And so, as the sun set on that historic day, the world knew that a new chapter had begun. A chapter that would change the course of history forever. Chapter 6. Building a New Nation. The war was over. The battle for independence had been won. The American colonies were now free from British rule, but with freedom came a new challenge. Building a new nation from the ground up. The people were excited, hopeful, and full of dreams for the future. But they were also nervous. How would they govern themselves? What kind of country would they create? Thomas Jefferson, who had been such a powerful voice during the Revolution, knew that the work was far from finished. Winning freedom was only the first step. Now the real challenge began, shaping a government that would reflect the values of liberty, justice, and equality that he had written about in the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson believed in democracy, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This idea was revolutionary. For centuries, people had been ruled by kings and queens, by emperors and tyrants. But Jefferson envisioned something different. A government where the power rested not in the hands of a single ruler, but with the people themselves. As the new nation began to take shape, Jefferson was at the forefront of the efforts to create a fair and just government. He returned to Virginia, where he was elected to the state legislature. There, he set to work on reforming the state's laws, many of which were outdated and unfair. One of his first major accomplishments was drafting a bill for religious freedom. Jefferson believed that everyone should have the right to worship as they chose, without interference from the government. This was a bold idea, but Jefferson knew it was essential for a free society. But Jefferson's ambitions didn't stop at Virginia. He had a vision for the entire nation. He wanted to create a government that would protect the rights of every citizen, rich or poor, powerful or humble. He believed that the government should be limited in its power, that it should serve the people, not control them. In 1787, Jefferson was serving as the U.S. ambassador to France when a group of American leaders gathered in Philadelphia 
to write a new constitution for the United States. Although Jefferson was not there, his ideas and writings had a strong influence on the discussions. The result was the U.S. Constitution, a document that laid out the framework for the new government. When Jefferson returned to America in 1789, he found a nation still finding its way. The new government was in place, but there were many challenges ahead. People had different ideas about how the country should be run, and there were disagreements about the role of the federal government. Some leaders, like Alexander Hamilton, believed in a strong central government with broad powers. But Jefferson had a different vision. He believed in a smaller government, one that left most of the power in the hands of the states and the people. This difference in opinion led to the formation of the first political parties in the United States. On one side were the Federalists, led by Hamilton, who wanted a strong central government and close ties with Britain. On the other side were the Democratic Republicans, led by Jefferson, who wanted to limit the power of the federal government and protect the rights of the states and individuals. Jefferson and Hamilton's rivalry was intense. They argued about everything, from how to handle the nation's debt to how to interpret the Constitution. But despite their differences, they both wanted what was best for the country. They just had very different ideas about how to achieve it. In 1790, President George Washington asked Jefferson to be his Secretary of State, a position that put him in charge of foreign affairs. Jefferson accepted the position, even though it meant working closely with Hamilton, who was now the Secretary of the Treasury. The two men clashed often, but Jefferson used his position to promote his vision of America, a nation of independent farmers, free from the influence of big banks and big cities. But Jefferson's biggest contribution to building the new nation came when he was elected as the third president of the United States in 1801. His election was a turning point in American history. It was the first time that power had peacefully transferred from one political party to another. This was a big deal. It showed that the new government could survive even when leaders with very different ideas took charge. As president, Jefferson worked to make the government smaller and more efficient. He cut taxes, reduced the size of the military, and paid off a large portion of the national debt. He also focused on expanding the country's territory. In 1803, he made the Louisiana Purchase, a deal with France that doubled the size of the United States. This was a bold move, and it opened up vast new lands for settlement and exploration. But Jefferson's presidency wasn't without its challenges. He had to navigate tensions with Britain and France, who were at war with each other and often interfered with American trade. He also faced opposition at home from people who didn't agree with his policies. But through it all, Jefferson remained committed to his vision of a government that served the people and protected their rights. After serving two terms as president, Jefferson retired to his beloved home, Monticello. But even in retirement, he continued to influence the direction of the nation. He founded the University of Virginia, a place where young minds could be educated in the principles of liberty and democracy. Education, he believed, was the key to a strong and free nation. As the years passed, the country Jefferson had helped build continued to grow and change. New challenges arose, and new leaders emerged to tackle them. But the foundation that Jefferson had helped lay, a foundation built on the principles of democracy, individual rights, and limited government, remained strong. Jefferson's legacy as a nation builder is one of the most important in American history. He helped create a government that was unlike any the world had ever seen. A government that put the power in the hands of the people. And while he didn't always get everything right, his vision and his determination to build a nation that would stand the test of time have made him one of the most important figures in the story of America. And so, as Thomas Jefferson looked out over the fields of Monticello, he could take pride in what he had helped create. A nation of free people, governed by laws that protected their rights. A nation that, despite its flaws and challenges, 
would continue to strive toward the ideals of liberty and justice for all. Chapter 7. Secretary of State and More The year was 1790, and the young United States was still finding its way. The revolution had ended, and the colonies had become a nation. But the work of building that nation was far from over. The new government was just beginning to take shape, and it needed strong leaders to guide it through its early years. That's when President George Washington turned to Thomas Jefferson, asking him to take on a big job. Secretary of State. This was no ordinary position. The Secretary of State was responsible for managing the country's relationships with other nations, a role that was crucial for a country trying to establish itself on the world stage. Jefferson knew the importance of this task. He had spent years in France as an ambassador, learning the art of diplomacy, and now he would use that experience to help guide America. Jefferson accepted the job with a sense of duty. He knew that the decisions he would make as Secretary of State would shape the future of the country. But he also knew that this job would come with challenges, challenges that would test not only his skills, but also his beliefs. As Secretary of State, Jefferson had to deal with many important issues. One of the biggest was how to navigate the complicated relationships between the United States and the powerful countries of Europe, like Britain and France. These nations were often at odds with each other, and their conflicts sometimes threatened to drag America into their wars. Jefferson believed in staying neutral. He didn't want America to get caught up in European struggles. He thought the best way to protect the young nation was to focus on building it up from within, rather than getting involved in foreign conflicts. But not everyone agreed with Jefferson's ideas. Alexander Hamilton, who was serving as Secretary of the Treasury, had a different vision. Hamilton wanted to strengthen ties with Britain, believing that a strong relationship with the world's most powerful empire would benefit America's economy. This difference in opinion led to many heated debates between Jefferson and Hamilton, debates that would shape the direction of the nation. Jefferson believed that the United States should be a nation of independent farmers, living simply and freely. He worried that too close a relationship with Britain, with its powerful banks and big cities, would lead America down a path that could threaten the freedoms the revolution had fought for. Hamilton, on the other hand, saw the future of America as an industrial and commercial powerhouse, with a strong central government to support it. These differences of opinion were more than just personal disagreements. They represented two very different visions for the future of the United States. And as Jefferson worked as Secretary of State, he found himself increasingly at odds with Hamilton and those who supported his ideas. The tension between them grew, leading to the formation of the first political parties in America. Jefferson's supporters became known as the Democratic Republicans, while Hamilton's followers were called the Federalists. But Jefferson's challenges as Secretary of State didn't stop with domestic politics. The world was watching this new nation, and some countries were testing its resolve. In 1793, war broke out between Britain and France, two of the most powerful countries in the world. The United States found itself caught in the middle, with both Britain and France trying to pull America into the conflict. Jefferson believed it was crucial for America to stay neutral, to avoid being dragged into a war that could destroy the young nation. Jefferson's stance on neutrality was tested when Britain began attacking American ships, seizing their cargo, and even forcing American sailors to serve in the British Navy. This was a serious threat to America's sovereignty, and many people called for war with Britain. But Jefferson urged caution. He knew that the United States was still too weak to take on a powerful nation like Britain in open conflict. Instead of war, Jefferson pushed for diplomacy. He helped negotiate a treaty with Britain, known as Jay's Treaty, which aimed to resolve some of the issues between the two countries. The treaty wasn't perfect. In fact, many people were unhappy with it, 
believing it gave too much to Britain and not enough to the United States. But Jefferson saw it as a way to keep the peace and give America time to grow stronger. Despite his efforts to steer the nation on a path of peace and independence, Jefferson grew increasingly frustrated with the direction the government was taking. He saw Hamilton's influence growing, and he worried that the Federalists were moving the country toward a more centralized and powerful government, one that could threaten the liberties he held dear. By 1793, Jefferson had had enough. He decided to resign as Secretary of State, returning to his home at Monticello. He needed time to reflect, to recharge, and to think about the future. But even as he stepped away from government, Jefferson's mind was never far from the challenges facing the nation. He knew that his role in shaping America was not yet finished. In the years that followed, Jefferson continued to speak out against what he saw as the overreach of the federal government. He wrote letters, gave speeches, and worked to build support for his vision of America, a vision of a nation that was free, independent, and governed by the people. His words resonated with many, and soon the political tide began to turn. In 1796, Jefferson ran for President of the United States. It was a hard-fought campaign, filled with passionate debates and fierce rivalries. In the end, Jefferson narrowly lost to John Adams, who had been Washington's vice president. But Jefferson didn't walk away defeated. He became the vice president under Adams, continuing to fight for his beliefs and prepare for another chance to lead the nation. Jefferson's time as Secretary of State had been filled with challenges, challenges that tested his beliefs and his leadership. But through it all, he remained committed to the principles of democracy, freedom, and independence. He knew that the future of America depended not just on winning battles or making treaties, but on staying true to the ideals that had inspired the revolution in the first place. And so, as the new century approached, Thomas Jefferson stood ready for the next chapter in his journey, a chapter that would see him rise to the highest office in the land, where he would continue to shape the destiny of the nation he had helped to create. Chapter 8. A New Vision. The Birth of Political Parties. America was growing and with that growth came new challenges. The nation was young, full of promise, but also full of different ideas about what it should become. As the country expanded, so did the debates about how it should be governed. And at the center of these debates were two men with very different visions, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Thomas Jefferson had a dream a vision of a nation where people lived simply and freely, in small towns and on family farms. He believed that the strength of America lay in its independent farmers, people who worked the land, provided for themselves, and lived lives of modesty and virtue. Jefferson saw these farmers as the backbone of the nation, the true keepers of American freedom and democracy. But not everyone shared Jefferson's vision. Alexander Hamilton, who had been a close advisor to President George Washington and served as Secretary of the Treasury, had a very different idea of what America should be. Hamilton believed in a strong central government, a government that could support a growing economy, build big cities, and create a powerful nation. He wanted America to be a leader in trade and industry, with banks and businesses driving the economy. These two visions couldn't have been more different, and the disagreements between Jefferson and Hamilton grew more intense with each passing day. Their debates were not just about policies or laws, they were about the very soul of the nation. What kind of country would America become? Would it be a nation of small farmers or a nation of big cities and industries? Would the power lie with the people or with a strong central government? As these questions were debated in the halls of government, something new began to take shape. Political parties. Up until this point, the idea of political parties was something many leaders, including Washington, had hoped to avoid. They feared that parties would divide the nation 
creating factions that would fight against each other instead of working together for the common good. But the differences between Jefferson and Hamilton were too great to ignore. And soon, the nation found itself divided. On one side were the Federalists, led by Hamilton. The Federalists believed in a strong central government, close ties with Britain, and the importance of trade and industry. They wanted a government that could help guide the nation's economy, build infrastructure, and maintain order. On the other side were the Democratic Republicans, led by Jefferson. The Democratic Republicans believed in limited government, the rights of the states, and the importance of agriculture. They wanted a government that stayed out of people's lives as much as possible, allowing them to live freely and govern themselves. Jefferson's vision of America was rooted in his deep belief in the wisdom of the common people. He trusted that farmers and small-town citizens knew what was best for their own lives and communities. He feared that a strong central government would become too powerful, that it would start making decisions for the people instead of letting them decide for themselves. The birth of political parties didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual process fueled by the debates and disagreements between leaders like Jefferson and Hamilton. But by the mid-1790s, the division was clear. The Federalists and the Democratic Republicans were two distinct groups, each with its own ideas about how the country should be run. Jefferson found himself leading the Democratic Republicans, fighting for his vision of America. He traveled across the country, giving speeches, writing letters, and building support for his ideas. He believed passionately that the future of the nation depended on staying true to the principles of the revolution, the principles of liberty, equality, and the rights of the individual. But Jefferson's leadership wasn't just about opposing Hamilton and the Federalists. He also worked to build a positive vision for the future. He wanted to create a nation where education was available to everyone, where people could worship freely, and where the government was truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. He believed that America could be a beacon of freedom and democracy for the world, a nation that showed what was possible when people were free to govern themselves. The rivalry between Jefferson and Hamilton became one of the most famous in American history. Their debates shaped the direction of the nation and laid the groundwork for the two-party system that still exists today. But their differences were not just about policies. They were about two very different ways of seeing the world. For Jefferson, the fight was deeply personal. He saw the Federalists as a threat to everything he had fought for during the Revolution— he believed that if Hamilton's vision of a strong central government and big cities took hold, America would lose its soul. The country would become just like Europe, with a powerful elite controlling the lives of ordinary people. But Jefferson's fight was not just against Hamilton. It was also against the challenges of a changing world. America was growing, and with that growth came new challenges that no one had foreseen. The country was becoming more diverse, more complex, and more connected to the rest of the world. Jefferson knew that his vision of a simple agrarian society might not be enough to meet these challenges. But he also believed that the principles of liberty and democracy could guide the nation through whatever lay ahead. As the years passed, the political landscape continued to evolve. Jefferson's Democratic Republicans grew in strength winning more elections and gaining more influence. But the debates between the two parties never really ended. They continued to argue about the role of government, the direction of the economy, and the future of the nation. And through it all, Jefferson remained committed to his vision, a vision of a nation where people lived simply, freely, and independently. He knew that America would continue to grow and change but he believed that the core principles of liberty and democracy would always be the foundation of the nation. As the first political parties took shape, Jefferson's leadership helped to define the direction of the country. His ideas, his vision, and his passion for freedom 
left a lasting impact on American history. And while the debates between Federalists and Democratic Republicans may have been fierce, they also helped to shape the nation into what it is today, a nation where different ideas can be debated, where people can choose their leaders, and where the voice of the people remains the most powerful force of all. Chapter 9. The President of the People The year was 1801, and a new chapter in American history was about to begin. Thomas Jefferson, the man who had written the Declaration of Independence and fought tirelessly for the rights of the people, was about to become the third President of the United States. It was a time of hope and change, and the nation looked to Jefferson for leadership, for a vision of the future. Jefferson's journey to the presidency had not been easy. The election of 1800 was one of the most contentious in American history. The country was deeply divided between the Federalists, led by John Adams, and the Democratic Republicans, led by Jefferson. The campaign was filled with bitter attacks and fierce debates, but in the end, Jefferson emerged victorious. The people had chosen him to lead, and he was ready to serve. On a cold March morning in 1801, Jefferson stood on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and took the oath of office. As he spoke to the crowd gathered before him, he called for unity and peace. We are all Republicans, we are all Federalists, he declared, reminding the nation that despite their differences, they were all Americans, united by a common cause. It was a message of reconciliation a message that set the tone for his presidency. Jefferson believed in the power of the people, the common man who worked the fields, built the towns, and shaped the future of the nation. He saw his role as president not as a ruler, but as a servant of the people. He wanted to make the government smaller, reduce taxes, and give more power to the states. He believed that the best government was the one that governed least, the one that allowed people to live their lives freely and independently. One of Jefferson's first acts as president was to reduce the size of the federal government. He cut spending, reduced the national debt, and eliminated many of the taxes that had been put in place by the previous administration. He also reduced the size of the military, believing that a large standing army was a threat to liberty. Instead, he focused on building a strong navy to protect American interests overseas. But Jefferson's presidency was not just about reducing government. It was also about expanding the nation. In 1803, he made one of the most significant decisions of his presidency, the Louisiana Purchase. For just $15 million, Jefferson bought a vast territory from France, doubling the size of the United States overnight. This was a bold move one that opened up new lands for settlement and exploration. It was a moment of great promise as Americans began to dream of new opportunities in the West. However, the Louisiana Purchase also presented challenges. The vast new territory needed to be explored and mapped, and Jefferson knew just the men for the job. He sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on an expedition to explore the new lands, find a route to the Pacific Ocean, and establish relationships with the Native American tribes who lived there. The Lewis and Clark expedition, as it came to be known, was a great success. It brought back valuable information about the geography, wildlife, and people of the West, and it inspired a new generation of Americans to move westward. But Jefferson's presidency was not without its difficulties. The issue of slavery, which had been a dark shadow over the nation since its founding, continued to haunt him. Jefferson, who owned slaves himself, struggled with the contradiction between his belief in liberty and the reality of slavery. He spoke out against the practice, but he also knew that ending it would be difficult and dangerous. The nation was not ready to confront the issue, and Jefferson was unable to find a solution during his presidency. It was a challenge that would eventually tear the country apart in the years to come. Another challenge Jefferson faced was the growing tension between the United States and European powers. Britain and France were at war, and both nations were trying to drag America into the conflict. 
British ships were attacking American merchant vessels, seizing their cargo, and forcing American sailors into the British Navy. Jefferson knew that the young nation could not afford another war, so he tried to avoid conflict through diplomacy. He imposed an embargo, stopping all American trade with foreign nations, hoping to pressure Britain and France into respecting American neutrality. But the embargo backfired. Instead of hurting Britain and France, it hurt American merchants and farmers. The economy suffered, and many people blamed Jefferson for the hardship. The embargo was eventually lifted, but the damage had been done. It was a painful lesson for Jefferson, one that showed how difficult it was to keep the nation out of the conflicts of the wider world. Despite these challenges, Jefferson's presidency was marked by many achievements. He expanded the nation's territory, promoted education, and worked to create a government that was responsive to the needs of the people. He also set an important precedent by stepping down after two terms, following the example of George Washington. He believed that no one person should hold too much power for too long, and his decision to step aside helped to establish the peaceful transfer of power as a cornerstone of American democracy. As Jefferson left the presidency in 1809, he returned to his beloved home at Monticello. He was older now, and his hair had turned white, but his passion for learning and his love for his country were as strong as ever. He spent his final years writing, reading, and corresponding with friends and colleagues. He also founded the University of Virginia, a place where young people could be educated in the principles of liberty and democracy. Jefferson's legacy as the President of the People is one of the most enduring in American history. He believed in the power of the common man, in the ability of ordinary people to govern themselves and build a nation based on the principles of freedom and equality. His presidency was a time of hope and change, a time when the young nation began to find its way in the world. And although he faced many challenges, Jefferson remained true to his principles, leaving a lasting impact on the country he loved so dearly. As the sun set on Jefferson's life, the nation he had helped to build stood strong, a beacon of liberty and democracy for the world. His vision of a government that served the people, protected their rights, and allowed them to live freely and independently had become the foundation of the American dream. And his legacy, like the words he wrote in the Declaration of Independence, would continue to inspire generations to come. Chapter 10. The Louisiana Purchase, America Grows. The year was 1803, and America was about to take a bold step that would change its future forever. Thomas Jefferson, now the President of the United States, had a vision. A vision of a vast and free nation stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. He dreamed of an empire of liberty where people could live freely, work the land, and build new lives. But to make that dream a reality, Jefferson would have to take a gamble, a gamble that would double the size of the United States. At the time, the United States was still a young nation, and its western border ended at the Mississippi River. Beyond that river lay a vast, mysterious land known as the Louisiana Territory. This enormous territory stretched from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains, and it was controlled by France. The land was rich and fertile, perfect for farming and settlement, but it was also largely unexplored. Jefferson knew that if America could gain control of this territory, it would open up endless possibilities for growth and expansion. But how could he make that happen? The answer came from an unexpected place, the politics of Europe. At the time, France was ruled by a powerful leader named Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon had big plans for Europe and the world, but he was also facing many challenges. His wars in Europe were costly, and he needed money to fund his campaigns. At the same time, he was struggling to maintain control of French colonies in the Americas, particularly in the Caribbean. Sensing an opportunity, Jefferson decided to act. He sent two of his most trusted advisors, James Monroe and Robert Livingston, to France with a bold proposal to buy the port city of New Orleans. 
New Orleans was a crucial city for America because it controlled access to the Mississippi River, the main trade route for farmers and merchants in the western states. Jefferson believed that if America could buy New Orleans, it would secure the country's economic future. But when Monroe and Livingston arrived in France, they received an offer that took them by surprise. Napoleon was willing to sell not just New Orleans, but the entire Louisiana Territory. The price? Fifteen million dollars. A huge sum of money at the time, but a bargain for such a vast expanse of land. The offer was almost too good to be true. Monroe and Livingston knew that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and they quickly agreed to the deal, even though they hadn't been authorized to buy the entire territory. They sent word back to Jefferson, who was thrilled by the news, but also faced a tough decision. Could he justify spending so much money on this purchase? And did he even have the constitutional authority to make such a deal? Jefferson believed deeply in following the Constitution, and nowhere in that document did it say that the president had the power to buy land from a foreign country. He worried that some people might accuse him of overstepping his authority. But in the end, Jefferson decided that the benefits of the purchase were too great to pass up. He believed that this was a rare chance to secure the future of the nation. And so, he put aside his doubts and made the decision to move forward. In 1803, the Louisiana Purchase was finalized. With the stroke of a pen, the United States doubled in size, adding more than 800,000 square miles of land to the country. It was a monumental achievement, and it marked the beginning of a new era for America. The young nation was no longer just a cluster of states along the Atlantic coast. It was now a vast country with endless possibilities. But the Louisiana Purchase was just the beginning. The new territory was largely unexplored, and Jefferson knew that the United States needed to learn more about this land and its people. So he commissioned an expedition to explore the new territory, an expedition that would become one of the most famous in American history. Jefferson chose two men to lead the expedition. Meriwether Lewis, his personal secretary, and William Clark, an experienced soldier and outdoorsman. Together, Lewis and Clark set out on a journey that would take them thousands of miles across rugged terrain, through dense forests and over towering mountains. Their mission was to map the land, study its plants and animals, and establish relationships with the Native American tribes who lived there. The Lewis and Clark expedition, also known as the Corps of Discovery, was an epic adventure. The men faced many challenges along the way, from harsh weather and dangerous animals to difficult river crossings and encounters with unfamiliar tribes. But they also made incredible discoveries, finding new species of plants and animals and mapping a route to the Pacific Ocean. The expedition took more than two years, and when Lewis and Clark finally returned to St. Louis in 1806, they were hailed as heroes. They brought back valuable information that would help settlers move westward, and their journey helped to open up the new territory for exploration and settlement. But even as Jefferson celebrated the success of the Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark Expedition, he knew that there were still many challenges ahead. The new territory needed to be governed, and there were complex questions about how to manage the land and the people who lived there. The Native American tribes, who had lived on the land for centuries, would face new pressures as settlers moved west, and the issue of slavery, which was already dividing the country, would become even more contentious as the nation expanded. Jefferson's vision of an empire of liberty was coming to life, but it was also clear that the journey was far from over. The Louisiana Purchase was a huge step for the young nation, but it was just one part of a much larger story. A story of a nation growing, changing, and struggling to live up to the ideals of freedom and equality that Jefferson had written about in the Declaration of Independence. As Jefferson looked back on the Louisiana Purchase in his later years, he saw it as one of his greatest achievements. It was a bold decision, 
one that required vision, courage, and a willingness to take risks. But it was also a decision that would shape the future of the United States, opening up new lands for exploration, settlement, and opportunity. Chapter 11, The Later Years, A Legacy of Learning Thomas Jefferson had served his country well. After two terms as President of the United States, he decided it was time to step away from the world of politics. It was 1809, and at 66 years old, Jefferson was ready to return to the place he loved most, his beloved home, Monticello. Nestled in the rolling hills of Virginia, Monticello was more than just a house. It was Jefferson's sanctuary, a place where he could relax, reflect, and continue his lifelong pursuit of knowledge. But retirement for Jefferson didn't mean a quiet life of leisure. Far from it. Jefferson was a man of endless curiosity and energy. Even in his later years, he continued to think deeply about the future of the nation he had helped to create. His mind was always active, always seeking new ways to improve the world around him. One of Jefferson's greatest passions was education. He believed that knowledge was the key to freedom that an educated people could better govern themselves and make wise decisions for the future. Jefferson had always dreamed of creating a place where young minds could grow and learn, free from the influences of church and state, a place where students could explore new ideas, challenge old beliefs, and prepare to lead the nation. This dream became a reality in 1819, when Jefferson founded the University of Virginia. He saw the university as his final gift to the nation, a place where the principles of democracy and liberty could be nurtured and passed on to future generations. Jefferson was deeply involved in every aspect of the university's creation. He designed the campus, choosing a layout that reflected his love of architecture and his belief in the power of education. The heart of the university was the rotunda, a magnificent building inspired by the ancient Roman pantheon. It was a symbol of the knowledge and wisdom that Jefferson believed should guide the nation. Around the rotunda, he designed pavilions and dormitories, creating a unique environment where students and professors could live and learn together. Jefferson didn't just design the buildings, he also helped to shape the curriculum. He wanted the University of Virginia to be a place where students could study a wide range of subjects, from science and mathematics to history and philosophy. He believed that a well-rounded education was essential for the development of good citizens, citizens who could think critically, solve problems, and contribute to the growth of the nation. As the university took shape, Jefferson poured his heart and soul into the project. He corresponded with scholars from around the world, gathering ideas and advice. He worked tirelessly to raise funds and recruit the best teachers. For Jefferson, the University of Virginia was not just another institution. It was the embodiment of his lifelong commitment to learning and progress. But even as he worked on the university, Jefferson found time for other pursuits. He spent his days at Monticello surrounded by books, papers, and the beauty of nature. He continued to write letters to friends, family, and fellow leaders, sharing his thoughts on everything from politics and philosophy to gardening and science. Jefferson's letters were filled with wisdom and insight, and they remain an important part of his legacy. Jefferson also spent time with his family, enjoying the company of his children and grandchildren. Monticello was a lively place, filled with laughter, conversation, and the hustle and bustle of daily life. Jefferson took great joy in watching his grandchildren grow, teaching them about the world and passing on his love of learning. But Jefferson's later years were not without challenges. The nation he had helped to build was changing, and not always in ways that he approved of. He watched with concern as political divisions deepened and as the issue of slavery continued to tear the country apart. Jefferson had always struggled with the contradiction between his belief in liberty and his ownership of slaves. He spoke out against the practice, but he also knew that finding a solution would be difficult and painful. As he grew older, 
Jefferson spent more time reflecting on his life and the principles he had fought for. He took pride in the role he had played in the American Revolution, in the writing of the Declaration of Independence, and in the creation of a government that was based on the rights of the people. But he also knew that the work was far from finished. The nation was still young, still evolving, and the challenges of the future would require wisdom, courage, and dedication. In the final years of his life, Jefferson's thoughts often turned to the legacy he would leave behind. He wanted to be remembered, not just as a president or a statesman, but as a man who had devoted his life to the pursuit of knowledge and the betterment of humanity. He believed that the principles of democracy, freedom, and education were the keys to a prosperous and just society, and he hoped that these principles would continue to guide the nation long after he was gone. On July 4, 1826, exactly 50 years after the Declaration of Independence was adopted, Thomas Jefferson passed away at the age of 83. His death marked the end of an era, but his legacy lived on. The University of Virginia, the Declaration of Independence, and the countless ideas he had championed throughout his life continued to shape the nation. Jefferson's later years were filled with reflection, but also with the knowledge that his ideas would live on. He had helped to build a nation based on the principles of liberty, justice, and equality, and he had left behind a legacy of learning that would inspire generations to come. His vision of an educated, informed, and free society remains one of the cornerstones of American democracy, and his contributions to the nation are still celebrated today. Chapter 12. The Legacy of Thomas Jefferson the date was July 4, 1826, a day that marked the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. It was a day of celebration for the young United States, a day to remember the birth of a nation and the courage of those who had fought for its freedom. But on this day, something remarkable happened. Thomas Jefferson, one of the greatest architects of that freedom, passed away quietly at his home in Monticello. His life had come full circle, ending on the very day that his most famous words had been adopted by a new nation. Jefferson was 83 years old when he died, and his life had been one of extraordinary service, innovation, and courage. From his early years as a lawyer and a revolutionary, to his time as president and his later years as a founder of the University of Virginia, Jefferson had dedicated himself to the cause of liberty and the betterment of humanity. He was a man of many talents, a writer, a thinker, an inventor, and a leader. But above all, he was a man who believed deeply in the power of ideas to change the world. The legacy of Thomas Jefferson is vast and enduring. His most famous contribution, the Declaration of Independence, continues to inspire people around the world. The words he wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, have become a powerful statement of human rights and dignity. These words have been quoted by leaders and activists, by those fighting for freedom and justice, and by anyone who believes in the fundamental equality of all people. But Jefferson's legacy goes beyond the Declaration of Independence. As president, he expanded the nation's territory with the Louisiana Purchase, opening up new lands for exploration and settlement. He championed the rights of the states and the importance of a government that served the people. He believed in democracy, in the idea that the government should be by the people and for the people, and he worked tirelessly to make that vision a reality. Jefferson also left a lasting impact on education. His founding of the University of Virginia was a reflection of his belief that knowledge was the key to freedom. He wanted to create a place where young minds could be nurtured, where they could learn the principles of liberty and democracy, and where they could prepare to lead the nation into the future. The University of Virginia stands today as a testament to Jefferson's commitment to education and his belief in the power of learning to change the world. But Jefferson's legacy is not without its complexities. He was a man who owned slaves even as he wrote about the rights of all people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
This contradiction is a difficult part of his story, one that has led to much reflection and debate. Jefferson himself struggled with the issue of slavery, recognizing its injustice but unable to find a way to end it in his own lifetime. His legacy, therefore, is one that challenges us to think deeply about the complexities of history and to recognize that even the greatest leaders are not without their flaws. Despite these challenges, Jefferson's vision of a free and democratic society has continued to shape the United States. His ideas about government, about the rights of individuals, and about the importance of education have become cornerstones of American democracy. The principles he fought for, the belief in equality, in freedom, and in the power of the people, are still at the heart of the American experience. Jefferson's influence can be seen in the movements for civil rights, in the expansion of voting rights, and in the ongoing efforts to create a more just and equal society. His dream of an empire of liberty has inspired generations of Americans to work for a nation where everyone has the opportunity to pursue their dreams, where the government protects the rights of all, and where the principles of liberty and justice are upheld. As we look back on the life of Thomas Jefferson, we see a man who was driven by a vision. A vision of a better world, a world where people could live freely and govern themselves. He was a man who believed that ideas could change the world, and he dedicated his life to turning those ideas into reality. His legacy is one of courage, innovation, and a deep commitment to the principles of democracy. Today, Jefferson's words continue to resonate. They remind us of the power of one person's vision to shape the course of history. They remind us that the fight for freedom and equality is never finished, that each generation must work to protect and expand the rights that Jefferson and his fellow revolutionaries fought for. And they remind us that, in the end, it is our ideas, our principles, and our dedication to justice that will define the legacy we leave behind. Thomas Jefferson's life was a testament to the power of ideas and the enduring impact of a commitment to liberty. His contributions to the American Revolution, to the founding of the United States, and to the principles of democracy have left an indelible mark on history. As we reflect on his legacy, we are reminded of the importance of vision, of courage, and of the belief that one person can make a difference. And so, as the sun sets on the story of Thomas Jefferson, we remember him not just as a founding father, but as a visionary, a man who believed in the power of ideas to change the world, and who dedicated his life to making that vision a reality. His dream of freedom and equality lives on, inspiring us all to continue the work of building a nation that truly embodies the principles of liberty, justice, and democracy for all.